Thank you for joining today's NIO webinar. This is Brianne Van Dyne, the Education Manager for Immunize Nevada, and I will be today's moderator. Before we get started, I'd like to review a couple of housekeeping items. First, locate the chat box in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. If you have any questions, type them in the chat box, and we will address those questions at the end of the presentation. Second, if you have requested nursing or pharmacy continuing education credits for today's webinar, please make sure you complete the survey in the post-webinar email. The email will be sent out by the end of today, and all CEUs will be mailed out within the next week. Additionally, in case of communication breakdown, please call right back and we will continue where we left off. A little disclaimer, Immunize Nevada Immunize Nevada's Nile webinars are made possible by the generosity of speakers who donate their time and expertise to benefit the coalition. The expectation and goal is for community partners to gain knowledge on immunization related topics through a non-branded, unbiased presentation. I'd like to now introduce our speaker, Cerise Moroda, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Families Fighting Flu, a national nonprofit 501c3 organization dedicated to saving lives and reducing hospitalizations by protecting children and their families against influenza through education and advocacy. Cerise originally came to Family Fighting Families Fighting Flu in 2010 following the loss of her five-year-old son Joseph to the flu in 2009. Cerise served on the Board of Directors for the organization for six years before coming on staff in May 2016 as the COO. Prior to joining Families Fighting Flu, Cerise worked as an environmental scientist for 16 years at a consulting firm conducting ecological and health, human health risk assessments for hazardous waste sites. She now works tirelessly to raise awareness about the seriousness of flu and the critical importance of annual flu vaccination for everyone six months and older. Thanks for joining us today, Cerise. Thank you for having me, Brianne, and thank you for that introduction, and welcome, everyone. So today we are going to talk about flu vaccination and how to make a strong flu vaccine recommendation. I know this title is a little bit generic, but we're hopefully going to give you guys some insight about things that you can take away from this presentation and hopefully use in your everyday practice. So I wanted to start by just framing out who we are. Some of you may be familiar with Families Fighting Flu and perhaps me, and some may not. So just very briefly, as Brianne said, Families Fighting Flu is a national nonprofit organization. We were actually formed back in 2004, um, not by me, but by families like mine who had experienced a loss due to flu, and these families got together and decided that they needed to do something about it. And so since then, we have been going strong. Our mission is very simple. It's to save lives and reduce hospitalizations by protecting all children and their families against flu. And our vision is that hopefully someday no one dies from this vaccine-preventable disease. And obviously that takes not only Families Fighting Flu as an organization, but all of you folks on this call, Immunize Nevada, um, all of us really working together towards that goal. So just very briefly, again, a high-level view of who Families Fighting Flu is, is we have advocates from around the globe. We have member families like myself that have been personally affected by flu. We also have a panel of medical advisors and professionals. And I certainly, disclaimer, I am not a medical doctor. Um, I feel like I know more about flu than I certainly ever wanted to know, but um, I am not a medical expert. So we have a panel of folks who we rely on for such expertise. We have a staff. Um, obviously, and then volunteers and advocates. And we have volunteers and advocates from across the country, across the United States, as well as some families that are more remotely involved from other countries as well. And then our partners. Again, we couldn't do the work that we do every day without um, our partners in this space. So, You'll find one common theme I'm going to weave in and out of today's discussion is the power of personal stories. And the pictures that you see in front of, 
in front of you are actually my son, Joseph. He passed away from flu um, exactly nine years ago today. So coincidentally, it is my honor to be talking to you today um, on what I call his angel anniversary. But Joseph was a healthy five-year-old. And I certainly, before Joseph passed away, never realized the dangers of flu. And when I came to this organization, you know, one thing I quickly realized is how powerful personal stories can be. So I just wanted to share this as kind of a, a preface to this theme that you'll see will be carried throughout our discussion today. And we're going to explore how to use these personal stories in our education, our advocacy, and our outreach efforts. Because what we've learned here at Families Fighting Flu is these personal stories and the sharing of these stories is really an integral part of the narrative. And I'll um, explain that further as we go throughout the, the presentation today. So just very briefly, uh, what Families Fighting flu does at the most basic level is education and advocacy work. We want to raise awareness about the seriousness of influenza and we want to advocate for annual flu vaccination as the best preventative measure against influenza every year. So this slide is a collage of some of our families. So some of these faces that you see staring back at you some of them are survivors and some of them um, are losses. But again, you know, sometimes uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. And I think sharing this particular collage just shows you that flu does not discriminate, as I'm sure all of you are very aware. You know, we have babies up through adults, um, healthy, immunocompromised. Um, unfortunately, we those of us like, you know, that are on the call today are, are all too familiar uh, with the fact that flu does not discriminate. Obviously, last flu season was very severe um, for both healthy children and adults and seniors. So our goal really here at the organization is to use our stories um, along with the education, the outreach, the advocacy to hopefully prevent this from happening to other families. So our objectives for today, um, number one, I'm going to walk through how to implement CDC's SHARE method to make strong flu vaccine recommendations to patients. And then secondly, I will talk about utilizing some resources that we here at Families Fighting Flu have developed, specifically our healthcare professional toolkit. And then again, which I've already touched upon, is how to use personal stories to communicate the dangers of flu and the importance of vaccination. So before we start there, let's just start with some facts. And again, many of you on this call may already be very familiar with these statistics, but I always like to start the conversation with, you know, why do we need to care about flu as an individual, as you know, a family member, a community member, as um, someone who works in the public health field? So last flu season was severe, as I mentioned, 80,000 deaths in the U.S. Uh, prior to last year, when I would talk about flu statistics, I would frequently cite um, the CDC data that said upwards of 56,000 people would lose their lives every year to flu. So obviously last year, that number just went up even more. Um, it's a hard number to think about when you think about how many families that is how many communities have been affected, but obviously flu is something that, that warrants all of our attention. On a global scale, flu kills approximately 650,000 people every year. Many of these people who are hospitalized or die from flu are not vaccinated. So the statistic from last year is around 80%. So 80% of people who die from flu are not vaccinated, so that's a problem. And what we're trying to do at Families Fighting Flu is get people to think beyond their own individual health about flu vaccination. So often we hear people say, I don't need to be vaccinated, I'm healthy, I'm strong, I'm young. Getting people to understand that annual flu vaccination is not just for protecting ourselves as individuals, but also for the benefit of public health, protecting our loved ones, protecting our communities. And the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, has recommended 
annual flu vaccination for everyone six months and older since 2010. And I just wanted to share this slide to give us some framework of where we are today. And this is a CDC slide, um, a graphic, I should say. And this shows us, you know, from 2010 through 2016-17, you know, where flu vaccination rates have been, both for children six months to 17 years and adults greater than 18 years. So as you can see, adults um, have been around that 43% mark um, have gone up since 2010, but obviously we want that number to keep going up. Likewise, children, their numbers are better than adults, but 2016, 17, 59%. So that's not ideal. So we know nationally speaking, we need to do better with our flu vaccination rates. And then for Nevada, um, you folks, unfortunately, you have some unique circumstances, um, you know, that, that perhaps have affected your flu vaccination rates in your state. But just again, I wanted to just share these and, and probably most of you on the call have seen these if you are from the state of Nevada. But in 2016-17, influenza vaccination coverage was at 36%. So definitely some room for improvement. And hopefully today we're going to give you some tools that you can then take and implement in your everyday practices. So I first want to touch upon the role of healthcare professionals. And first I want to start with what do I mean when I say healthcare professionals? Who, who is that? defined by. So healthcare professionals are doctors, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, healthcare workers, anyone really that is working in that realm of public health. Maybe you're working at a local clinic or the county health department. You know, you're working in public health. You're, you're interfacing with consumers and patients. Um, and healthcare professionals we know are a trusted resource. These are the people that patients and consumers are looking to for information. Um, so it's really important that you guys being in that healthcare space are equipped and you have the tools and the resources that you need to have those conversations and you have that information so that you can educate and inform the people that you're coming into contact with. Obviously, you are tasked with protecting public health, which is a huge undertaking, I know. Um, I just deal in the influenza space, so I know you folks that work in public health, you've got a, you've got a lot on your plate. So certainly my hat's off to you for, for filling that role. And, you know, you guys are setting the example, too. I think so often I hear that people who say, well, I didn't get my flu vaccine because my doctor didn't bring it up in conversation to me, so I didn't think it was important. You know, that's, I, I know healthcare professionals, have a lot on their plates when it comes to discussing and having those patient conversations, whether it's a well visit, whether it's a sick visit. But we just want to impress upon everyone how important that, that recommendation is for annual flu vaccination. It really is critical to the conversation. So I just said that HB, HCP recommendation is critically important to improving flu vaccination rates. And there are some limiting factors. We understand. We certainly as an organization deal with these right alongside you guys. Um, number one, patients are misinformed about flu and flu vaccination. I always say you need to get people to care about flu and then empower them. Education leads to empowerment. So we have to, you know, teach them, inform them, educate them that Flu is something that they need to pay attention to. Flu is not just a bad cold. It's not in the same category as the common cold. So number one is we need to get them to care about flu. And then when I talk about empowerment, I mean giving them the information and education that they require to then make an informed vaccination decision for themselves and their family. The second point I want to touch upon is failure to communicate. Uh, one thing I hear quite frequently is the communication between healthcare professionals and patients. Uh, I was just talking with someone about this the other day, and healthcare professionals sometimes we, you know, they think they're doing a good job of recommending flu vaccination to their patients, but 
interestingly enough, when the patients are asked, well, did your healthcare professional recommend this strongly to you? The patients are saying, mm, no, not so much. So there seems to be some breakdown in communication sometimes um, between healthcare professionals and patients, and obviously that is a two-way street. That's a two-way communication. But it's something that, you know, we want to address. And then touching upon passive versus presumptive vaccine recommendation. This is something that I think as healthcare professionals, everyone could and hopefully should be practicing is, you know, if you have a patient come in uh, to your practice clinic, what have you, and you pose the question, well, would you like your flu vaccine today? I think automatically the frame of mind that that sets the patient is, oh, well, I don't know, maybe I do, maybe I don't, but it's not, it's not increasing their comfort level, so to speak. And I'm, I'm using my personal experience as well. You know, when I go in and I talk to my doctor's pediatrician, I want her to answer me in a very confident, pretty assertive way. Like, yes, your daughter needs the HPV vaccine, and this is why, and this is what we're going to do today. So using that presumptive approach that, hey, I know you're here today to talk about X, Y, and Z, but while you're here, we're going to do your flu vaccination. Is that, you know, let's do this. Let's get it done, and then you can check that box and be on your way, and you're covered for the season. Um, so that is something that definitely we know can help move the needle when it comes to flu vaccination. And then missed opportunities for vaccination. Again, you might be seeing patients, whether it's for a well visit or a sick visit, but make every visit a vaccine visit. In other words, not just flu, but all vaccines. Check is that patient up to date on their, all their vaccinations. And if, if they're not, if it's appropriate to do so at that particular point in time during that visit, take that opportunity to do so. Because again, missed opportunities are something that we here at Families Fighting Flu share a lot about. Um, everyone is really busy. We all have busy lives, myself included. And so often what we've heard from some of our families here at Families Fighting Flu um, who have been personally affected is, you know, they meant to get their child vaccinated, but it fell off the radar, life got busy. And there's no one to blame in those particular circumstances, but I think if we all, you know, um, understand that we, we need to take advantage of those opportunities to have those conversations and, and get those flu vaccines done, the better off we will be. So next, I want to segue into the CDC's SHARE approach. And I'm going to take it step by step. Uh, SHARE is an acronym, so we're going to kind of work through all of these letters. And again, I'm going to be touching upon how do we weave in these personal stories into each of these elements. Because I think in most instances, there is an opportunity to use personal stories at each step of the process. So let's start with, with number one, S, which is for share, coincidentally. So when the patient comes in to talk to you about flu vaccination, you know, making those I statements and saying, why is flu vaccination the right choice for your patient? Um, we can talk about um, considerations. What, what should we talk about when we're talking about is flu vaccination right for you? Um, age is number one. Um, we know there are certain segments of the population that are especially susceptible to influenza complications. Those are young children, seniors, people who are immunocompromised. Um, but also we know, and last flu season again is an example, that flu does not discriminate. So we certainly want to identify those patients that are at that higher risk level those susceptible populations, and we want to make sure absolutely that those patients are vaccinated. But we also want everyone around them vaccinated too. So age is certainly one consideration that we want to think about when we're having those conversations with the patient. Health status is another. Um, you might have someone who is immunocompromised, who has comorbid conditions. 
Maybe they have asthma. Maybe they have diabetes, what have you. We know that, again, these people are at a higher risk, and those people are the ones that absolutely we want to be vaccinated. Um, and, again, we want, their, they want, we want them to be cocooned. We want people around them to be vaccinated, their family members, their caregivers, um, again, providing that extra layer of protection. And then lifestyle may be a factor, too. And lifestyle, the way I kind of think about it is, you know, maybe you're traveling frequently, so much more so now today than, than in, you know, in our history. This is a global issue. You know, these, when we're talking about infectious disease, it be it influenza or anything else, these infectious diseases do not know boundaries. Um, you know, we are jumping on airplanes and we're flying to different countries. And this is happening all day long all across the world. So, you know, lifestyle, if you're traveling frequently, if your patients are traveling frequently, I should say, if they have increased community contact, maybe they volunteer at a hospital, whatever their lifestyle may be, that might be something else you want to point out to them. Well, hey, because you are traveling quite frequently or because you are doing all that volunteer work, you might want to think of that, you know, even more so flu vaccination is something really important for you to be doing each and every year. And then obviously occupation, healthcare workers, healthcare professionals, um, those are the people obviously that we want to make sure are vaccinated as well. And again, setting the example for others. Um, but they are in constant contact with patients. They're picking up all kinds of germs and bugs and have the ability to spread those to others. So certainly we want to make sure that whatever their occupation is, that they're taking steps to protect not only themselves, but the people that they come into contact with. And then other risk factors, namely pregnant women is just one that I will you know, a segment of the population that I will mention that really it's so important for pregnant women to be vaccinated while they're pregnant, not only, again, to protect themselves, but to help protect that unborn baby during the first few months of life. So number two is highlight. So highlight positive experiences with flu vaccination, be it in your professional life or your private life to reinforce the benefits. And this is where we can make those I statements. And I know myself, again, when I go in and I have a conversation with my daughter's pediatrician, if I say to her, is this something you would do for your family? If she's able to say, yes, I always you know, do X, Y, or Z, or I always get vaccinated, I always vaccinate my family. Saying that I think really increases the comfort level of that person that's on the other end of that conversation. So being able to say, I always get myself and my family vaccinated every year because in whatever your reason is, um, I understand it's important. I want to protect my children, my parents, whatever it is. Um, I think sharing that and making it more of a personal conversation is, is really a good way to have that dialogue with the patient. And then again, bringing up um, flu vaccination isn't just about protecting ourselves, bringing up the concept of community immunity and telling them that this is really something that we can do for others. You know, maybe we, we might come into contact with someone who's going through cancer treatment or someone who can't get vaccinated themselves. And perhaps it's going to be a driver and a motivator for some people. Perhaps for some people it will not be. But I know myself, I always think of, you know, um, getting vaccinated as my obligation, not only to myself and my family, but to my community. Um, my, my son in 2009, he got the flu virus from someone. We don't know who that was. We don't know who Joseph's patient zero was. But I really, because of my personal experience, always think about the fact that I have the ability to affect someone, unbeknownst to me or not. So, you know, perhaps that might be a motivator that you could include in the conversation as you're talking this over with your patient. And then he's saying, I had a patient who fell ill with influenza, but their illness was mild because they were vaccinated. And we'll talk a little bit later maybe about, we know the flu vaccine is not perfect, not much in life is. But I think, again, people don't understand, um, the general public doesn't understand 
that, you know, why am I getting vaccinated? It doesn't necessarily mean 100% you're not going to catch the flu virus and become ill. But chances are if you're vaccinated and you still get sick, your illness is going to be mild. You're hopefully going to not be hospitalized and you're going to survive. And then as appropriate, certainly relying on science. That's something here at the organization we always like to fall back on. And because I am a scientist by nature in my former life, as I like to say, relying on facts, relying on science, um, and sharing those studies as appropriate with your patients and saying, hey, you know, there was this study that demonstrated X, Y, Z. Um, in this next slide, I'll share just um, some of those studies. But namely, the one I share quite frequently is, you know, that study that came out um, in 2017 by um, the CDC, which showed flu vaccination reduces pediatric deaths by 65% in healthy children. So we know, um, because we're messaging to the general public every day, there's a lot of statistics out there. There's a lot of information. The last thing we want to do is confuse people by throwing a lot of numbers at them. So, um, but this is always good information to have in our back pockets, right? So when we're, again, engaging in conversation with patients um, and discussing flu vaccination, it's good sometimes to have these studies and these statistics to back up what it is that you're sharing with them. There was a very recent study that just came out about flu vaccination in pregnant women and how it reduces their risk of being hospitalized from flu by 40%. And then another study from AAP in 2016 that showed flu vaccination in pregnant women reduces newborn flu risk by 70%. That's something I've heard very often is pregnant women especially, they may understand that they need to, do, to be vaccinated to protect themselves, but a lot of them, I, I, as I understand or as I've been told, don't necessarily understand the benefits of flu vaccination for their infant following birth. So that's something, again, we can really stress with those patients that we are seeing on those pregnant moms. And then I just included another study in there that talks about the benefits of flu vaccination in older adults. So number three, A is for address. So address patient questions using clear, understandable language. This is something that we do. Um, I should say our communications director does probably on a daily basis is because a lot of people have questions and concerns. And you know what? That's okay. We encourage them to ask questions. We want them to have all the information they need so that they have that comfort level they need to, again, make that informed decision about flu vaccination for themselves and their families. So again, getting them to care about flu. Why do they need to care about flu? That's kind of block number one, getting them to understand this is something that we need to talk about because it's important. And then a lot of the things that we hear, the questions, we have questions about potential side effects from vaccination. Um, and vaccine safety. So, you know, vaccine safety, the flu vaccine has been around for more than 50 years. It's safe. Um, we know that. There are data to back that up. But this is just me kind of showing the, the top three things, or I should say maybe three of the top five or ten things that we frequently at the organization get asked about. And, again, we always approach those conversations, be it in person, be it on social media, in a very respectful manner. We are never judgmental of people when they say, hey, you know, I'm concerned. What does this word thimerosal mean? And why does the flu vaccine, why are they talking about formaldehyde? For people that don't have a technical background, there's a lot of things, a lot of information, a lot of words out there that might be scary to them. And I get that as a parent. So that is something that we really always want to have an open dialogue with our patients, with our, you know, with the public about. And hopefully as healthcare professionals, I would in, encourage you to take the time to answer those questions as well. But again, in a, in a language and at a level that they can understand. Number four is remind. Uh, remind patients why flu vaccination is so important. And this is, you know, where family stories certainly can come in and Again, I think family stories can be integrated into each of these 
these steps. But why is flu vaccination so important? Um, explaining what flu vaccination is meant to do. Help prevent medically attended illness. Help, you know, prevent you from being in the hospital. Help prevent you from dying. Um, and remind patients it's not just about them. Again, going back to that concept of community immunity, um, for me, that concept seems like it should be intuitive, but surprisingly, I find out time and time again when I'm having private conversations with people that perhaps it's not. Um, so that's something, again, that we can highlight. And again, public responsibility, maybe that's a motivator for some people, maybe it's not. But I think just enlightening to them to that concept is a good thing. And then um, debunking myths and in focusing on facts. I think there's a lot of information out there, again, that can be confusing to patients. And, you know, we certainly don't want to throw a bunch of information at them at one time. We try to push things out in kind of a digestible manner, if you will, um, a little nuggets of information. But there's a lot of myths out there. So certainly you want to focus on debunking those myths, focusing on the facts, focusing on the science. And I certainly am not, I didn't list all of that information in here, but there's a lot of information on CDC's website. You can certainly um, visit our website, familiesfightingflu.org. Um, there's some information on there as well. So, but that's something that, you know, we as an organization see as our responsibility is, you know, we're all working together. So we're certainly trying to help you guys, um, give you guys the tools, information, and the resources that you need to then in turn have those conversations with your patients. So number five is explain. Um, this is one thing, again, that perhaps isn't intuitive to, to a lot of folks is explaining the potential costs of flu. And what do I mean by that? Talking about the serious health effects, um, hospitalization, death, long-term effects. You know, if we talk about seniors, um, think about an active senior who lives alone and all of a sudden they develop influenza and they have to go into a long-term care facility afterwards because they, you know, are compromised now. They can't get around as well. They have some long-term health effects. I mean, that is just, that's just as sad and tragic, you know, as, as all the other stories that we hear. If somebody's can't live the lifestyle that they were used to. So certainly there's some serious health effects that we want to explain. But also on the economic side, thinking about influenza and its potential impacts as far as missed school and work. You know, the statistics that I use quite frequently and I've quoted here are influenza um, is responsible for approximately 38 million missed school days every year. That's huge. 17 million missed work days every year. So think about that. You know, say I'm, I'm a mom. If my daughter's sick, I mean, she's 16 now, so she's pretty self-sufficient. But, you know, you have little kids. You have parents who have children at home. If the child has to miss school, then you have to stay home. You're missing work. So, you know, people don't really necessarily think about these more simplistic economic um, impacts of influenza, but it is at, it's a problem that we really need to convey again. And the financial costs, the medical expenses, I'm going to share a family story with you here in a moment about um, a survivor story, but a little girl whose mom, you know, she incurred a significant medical expenses after her child was hospitalized due to influenza. And obviously missing work, um, I think one thing, that I really like to encourage employers is having those flu clinics in the workplace. It's so convenient, and we know convenience sometimes is a barrier for people getting vaccinated. So when, you know, it's a win-win. When employers can, can encourage their employees to get vaccinated, when they can provide that service in-house, it's a win-win. Keep your employees healthy. Your productivity stays up. Everybody's doing what they need to do every day. Um, you know, it just, I, I think it's something that we, again, need to think about from several different angles. And that economic one is not something I think that comes to top of mind. And the CDC estimates the annual economic burden of flu in the U.S. 
is $87 billion. Um, that's a lot. So certainly something that, again, warrants our attention. So this little story, which I alluded to a moment ago, this sweet little beautiful girl, her name is Briar Lee, and her story is on our website. And she actually is from Reno, Nevada. And she thankfully is a survivor, um, but at four years old, she was hospitalized from flu. So, you know, this is a story that you folks in Nevada can, can share when you're having these conversations with patients. And certainly I will welcome you to use any of our family stories on our website. We're actually adding more as we speak. We have a backlog that we're trying to uh, get up there as fast as we can. But again, these personal stories, what we have found, this is what, if someone is, is what I call in that vaccine hesitant category. If someone says, okay, I, I, I hear the CDC information, I hear the statistics, um, Dr. So-and-so, I hear what you're saying to me and you're pointing all this out. I still am on the fence about flu vaccination. I don't know if it's right for me. Family stories are so important. This is what really we have found can move the needle when it comes to flu vaccination. Let me qualify that, though. We as an organization do not use these in a scary way. We never say, oh, my gosh, you have to get vaccinated because if not, something terrible could happen, and here's a story that proves that. We always want to present these in a very compassionate way, and that's, that's what we do. This is just another piece of information. We're not saying this in a threatening way. We're not saying, okay, here's this personal story, and this is what could happen to you. Yes, that is the truth. It could happen. It does happen. 183 children lost their lives to flu last season. Um, but we always want to do it in a very compassionate, respectful way. And I will tell you, I've shared my personal story, I've shared Joseph's story at so many conferences and meetings and in private conversations, and I always do it in a very compassionate way, and I always say, hey, look, here's just another piece of information for you. You've got a lot of information about flu and flu vaccination. This is just another piece of information for you. And when it's presented like that, the response is incredible. The response is compassion. And I've had so many people um, personally as well as just through the organization as recently as this week who reach out to us and say, you know what, I, I heard your story or I read your story and I'm going to go get my flu vaccine. And I can't tell you how emotionally impactful that is for me as a bereaved mother, but I just want to illustrate this that how powerful these stories can be. So again, please, please feel free to use these, but again, we always just ask that they are used in a compassionate, respectful manner, not ever in a way to scare your patients, just as an illustration, so to speak. So moving on, the next thing that I wanna talk about is Family Fighting Flu's Healthcare Professional Toolkit. So this is something that we developed last year. We just updated it again this year because we want to make sure this is always has the latest and greatest information for you folks. But this is something that we developed in conjunction with some partners. Um, the, Pediat uh, the National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners uh, nap nap as well as healthy women and the reason we developed this healthcare professional toolkit is because we recognize that there was a need again we recognize that healthcare professionals you guys have a really busy job you have a lot on your plate a lot to deal with so we wanted to develop a resource that had a lot of different elements in it that could, that you could use in your practices to help have those conversations with patients that had resources that you could put up on, on the office wall, on the exam room wall, to facilitate those conversations with patients, um, to use as an educational resource. So this was something that we saw there was a need and we wanted to connect the dots for you folks in the healthcare field and give you guys something that you could use in your practices. 
So I'm not going to go through it in a really deep dive, but just from a high level, there's a lot of different things in there, and I would certainly encourage all of you to go to the Families Fighting Flu website, familiesfightingflu.org. You can download this resource for free. We had it have it in both English and Spanish because we realize that there's a lot of need for Spanish resources out there as well. But it has some different elements in there, um, perspectives from a pediatric nurse practitioner, just kind of sharing her personal experiences um, over a 30-year career. Uh, we have family stories in there, two of them, which I'll touch upon in just a moment. We have a, what I would call kind of a conversation flow chart. So we know you guys get asked tough questions, and we have a Q&A in there that you can use as a guide for those conversations. And then just some key flu-related messages that you can share with patients, various flu facts and statistics, and then some educational infographics that, again, you can print, hand out, um, post on your walls, hand out to patients, that type of thing. So these are our personal stories. And again, these are just two of our many personal stories. Um, we'd certainly love to make a book, but we're not sure that's this, this probably a sad book nobody wants to read. So we figure, you know, if you want to read our family stories, the, the library is on our website. But we picked out these two family stories um, to include in the Healthcare Professional Toolkit. The little girl on the left, Caroline, she is a survivor, but she um, was near death from influenza, and she was hospitalized and had quite an ordeal. And the young man on the right, sadly, tragically lost his life to influenza. He was a healthy 17-year-old boy. So again, these are things that, you know, when you look at the toolkit, you can go in and cherry pick the resources that you want. You can print all of it out. Um, and use it as a complete guide. You can just print out the family stories or some of the other elements. Again, we wanted to put a bunch of different resources in there so that you could pick and choose, choose what is best um, suited for you and your practice. And this is just a, a graphic illustration of one of the pages of our flu Q&A. And again, we wanted to kind of come up with the, the top you know, handful of questions that we think you guys are probably getting asked every day about flu vaccination. And again, give you guys a guide of how you can work through that conversation with the patient. And then these are the two educational infographics that we have in there. And these can print out eight, eight by 10. Um, one is, you know, kind of taking a family oriented approach um, to your patients. So these really are patient-facing consumer resources. Um, number one is it's kind of a three-step thing, you know, getting people to think about flu as, <laughs> quote, unquote, this, you know, flu vaccination is a, a family activity that you can do. We know not everybody likes going and getting shots. We can all attest to that. I'm a parent. My 16-year-old daughter still doesn't like getting her flu vaccine, but she knows how important it is. Um, but, you know, it's a suggestion for us to make it a family event, get vaccinated together, do something fun afterwards, especially you have little kids. You don't want them to think like, oh, gosh, I have to go to the doctors. I'm getting a, a shot. What did I do wrong to them being punished? Um, not at all. We want, you know, kids to have a healthy, positive attitude about flu vaccination and encourage everyone do this as a family every year. And then the second one is getting to know the flu vaccine. This is something we put together, just kind of like the top 10, what we thought flu vaccine facts, um, people want to know. Uh, what we hear a lot at the organization is, you know, the flu vaccine, it's this mysterious thing that people just aren't sure about. And do I want to put that in my body? And I don't understand enough about it. So again, this is something that we wanted to put together as a resource for you folks so that you could hopefully share that information with your patients. In Families Fighting Flu as an organization, we have a ton of other resources. What you see before you is just a small subset. Again, I would encourage you to visit our website to get a full, you know, um, catalog, if you will, of everything we have to offer. But we have educational materials on our website that you can download. You can place an order for printed materials to our website. We have school worksheets that we developed as part of our Keep Flu Out of School program over the years. We have social media graphics, family video testimonials, infographics, public service announcements, 
Much of this stuff is on our website, and we invite you to use it. That is why we have developed these over the years. We want to get this information out there, so we make it available to you to use however you see fit, whether that's on social media, again, in your practices, what have you. So now I want to segue into the power of personal stories. And this picture you see in front of you, this again is an illustration. A picture is worth a thousand words. This young lady, her name is Maddie Allen, and thankfully she is a survivor. But when she was 12 years old, she almost died from influenza. In fact, they gave her a 1% chance of survival. And thankfully, she is a survivor. However, she has long term health effects that she will have for the rest of her life um, that she struggles with on a daily basis. She is, you know, a college student right now. She's a very active athlete. She was before she fell ill with influenza. But, you know, the reality is, like, this is what flu did. So how can we weave these personal stories into our outreach efforts, our education, our advocacy work? Patient conversations, obviously, this is something that I've been talking about, um, you know, throughout for the past little bit here. Social media is something I want to highlight, too. Um, social media is huge for us as an organization. It is one of our main communication channels, and it is super important. It is where we push out all this information, not just personal stories, but flu statistics, studies, surveillance, you name it. If it has anything to do with flu, we're trying to talk about it in an effort to educate and inform our audiences. So personal stories are certainly something that we quite frequently push out on social media. And I will tell you, I'll touch upon it a little bit later when I show you some examples, but so important and so impactful. And we see that when we look at our social media metrics. We're pushing out all types of information. What people engage with time and time again and are interested in is the personal stories. Uh, digital media, our website, as I indicated, has a library of our family stories. But this is something, again, I would encourage you folks, if, you know, whether it's through your practices or coalitions or what have you, um, you know, feel free if you want to link to our website or, you know, make some arrangement offline with, with us to share some of our family stories. Maybe you have a meeting coming up or you want a speaker, please reach out to us. Again, we are here as a resource, um, as a partner. We want to we wanna kind of team up with everybody so that we can all do our, do our jobs to help um, you know, get the information out there. And then earn media, that's something, again, that's very, uh, it's a very important communication channel for us. Um, and when I say earned media, I'm talking about, you know, TV, radio interviews, print publications. Last year, because it was such a severe flu season, we did so many um, media interviews. And when we looked at, you know, um, the size of our audience, just last year, we reached over 293 million people just through um, our print publications you know, those earned media opportunities. So, again, um, we understand that these personal stories are really an integral part of our education and advocacy efforts. And, again, awareness and education leads to empowerment. We understand there's a lot of people out there that view vaccination as their personal right. It's their personal choice. And I won't go into whether or not I agree with that, but we want to – understand our audience and their perspective and where they're coming from. And I always say, do the education, and education leads to empowerment. Empower them to make that informed decision about flu vaccination. Give them the information and the tools that they need to come to that decision. And our personal stories, as I just said, really do move people to action. And this is just a snapshot of um, one of the digital stories uh, on our website on the right, and then just a snapshot of some of our um, stories you'll see as you scroll through our website if you choose to visit it that, you know, this is kind of the layout. And we really are interested in stories across the lifespan, and 
this is something, you know, when the organization was first formed, our primary focus was on pediatrics because it was formed by, this organization was formed by families that had lost children. Since then, we have broadened that, and we want everyone six months and older to be vaccinated. So really, our mission is to get everyone six months and older vaccinated because we know flu doesn't discriminate. So we have geared our education, our outreach, our advocacy efforts to target everyone, um, children, adults, seniors, you name it. So um, that's just really important, and we understand that people identify with people who look like them, you know, who are kind of in that same space. Um, so we're trying, again, to build our repository of family stories so that we really do have representation across different demographics. And interestingly enough, you know, again, when we look at the metrics for our, our website, uh, personal stories make up 50% of our web traffic. So we have a lot of information on our website. But 50% of our traffic, they're looking at our family story. So, again, that just indicates, again, how powerful and impactful those personal stories are. Social media, I touched upon this briefly before. I never understood personally the power of social media until I started doing it. And now our communications director, I mean, this is, thank goodness for her, because it is such a big job. Again, people are getting their information from social media. They're getting their news from, them, um, from social media. 75% of parents, that's where they're getting advice. So, you know, it's a critical communication channel. Uh, we recognize that. We put a lot of effort and, um, into communicating on that channel. And we take that as a big responsibility, you know, for us to, to have that dialogue on that channel. And this is just some snapshots and examples of personal stories from last year's flu season that we shared. And you can see all of their, all of their faces. But, um, you know, personal stories can take on many different forms. Be it we have videos, we have personal stories. You'll even see in the lower left there that 21-year-old um, personal trainer that lost his life to flu last year. He's not one of our families. Um, we have not had an opportunity to connect with his family yet, but we just simply shared the media article that, you know, he was, that was written about him. And people respond to these personal stories. And again, when we looked at our metrics on um, social media channels, on Facebook and Twitter, our engagement on personal stories, again, compared to all other content, was 50% higher on Facebook and 35% higher on Twitter. So that tells us, again, what people are interested in, what they are engaging with. So I wanted to end with a call to action for you folks. So our little picture of a superhero, hero, this is something that I identify with every day. When I come into my office and I sit down in front of my computer, I realize that every day I have an opportunity to be a superhero. And so do you guys. And what do I mean by that? I mean every day you folks both personally and professionally, are coming into contact with people that you can impact, people that you can impress upon. Um, we all can be superheroes. We all can make a difference. We all can have a conversation or educate and inform someone about flu vaccination. And if that translates into that person going and getting vaccinated, you may never know, but you may have just saved someone's life. And for me, that's pretty huge. That's pretty monumental. So when there's days when I'm just kind of, you know, tired of flu and maybe I, I'm feeling a little less motivated, this is what I remember, this image of this little girl. And I think, you know what, i got to keep doing what I'm doing because everything I do today, it might save somebody's life. So maybe that sounds a little cliche, but honestly, sincerely, that is the way I look at it. So I would encourage you guys to be a superhero promote annual flu va vaccination. Have that conversation with not only your patients, but with your friends, your family, your neighbors, your community members. And above all, set the example. You know, that's something that I take very, very seriously is you got to walk the walk if you're going to talk the talk. So I always make sure, you know, we, all of us here at Families Fighting Flu, we set the example, you know, for, as early as we can in the season, we go out and get our flu vaccine and say, hey, this is what we're doing, and we want you to do it too. 
So number two, please use our resources. Um, again, we have developed these resources over the years to educate and inform our audiences, but we want you to use them too. So please visit the website, download the materials, use them as appropriate, and feel free to share our key messages too. And I mean, follow us on social media. We right now are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So please feel free to engage with us there, to share our content. Um, our communications director does a wonderful job of being creative and you know, putting out some really wonderful content. So please feel free to take advantage of that and piggyback on that when it's appropriate. And share our stories, our personal stories. We put them out there again so that you guys can lift them up and amplify their reach so that we're not stuck in this echo chamber sometimes. And again, we have different versions of those. We have them in print, the written stories, as well as the family video testimonials that you will find on our multimedia page. And we have public service announcements. So again, all of that is, is open for use by other individuals such as yourself. And encourage people um, in your practices, if you know someone professionally or privately that has been impacted by flu, please have them reach out to us. We would love to engage with them, um, not only to share their story, but you know, maybe you know someone that's been adversely impacted that needs support. We're here for that too. Um, we have traveled this road, we know it well, and it takes all of us, and we're a family, and we want, want to encourage, you know, that we are not a private club. We are open to everyone. And with that said, it's not just family members that are part of this organization. Anyone that is passionate about flu awareness, prevention, what have you, is welcome to join our organization. As I mentioned previously, we have medical um, a panel of medical advisors. Um, so we have healthcare professionals that not necessarily are medical advisors to us, but anyone is, is, is able to be part of this organization and be involved at whatever capacity works for you. And then thirdly, um, stay up to date on flu news by taking advantage of our newsletter. Um, we try to send that out quarterly. We may actually try to do it a little bit more frequently during flu season. And weekly flu news, that is something we push out through our database every Monday. And you can sign up for both of those through our website, familiesfightingflu.org. And then I've already mentioned, please follow us on social media. Um, again, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So with that, I think we are just about out of time. And I will put my contact information up. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, as needed, and I will turn it back over to Brianne for questions. Thank you so much, Cerise. Uh, before we say goodbye, um, I'd like to offer a little more time for last-minute questions. We did have one come in, um, so please type, type those questions in the chat box now. While we are waiting for those questions to be typed in, just a couple of reminders. If you have requested nursing or pharmacy continuing education credits for today's webinar, please make sure you complete the survey, which will pop up on your screen when the webinar is ended, or uh, will come through in that post-webinar email. The email will be sent out by the end of today, and all CEUs will be emailed out within the next week. If you'd like to view or share this webinar, the recording will be available on our website along with information for future webinars at immunizednevada.org forward slash webinars. Um, and the two questions that we've had come in, Cerise, is one um, was when and why did the increased importance of flu vaccination take place? Um, it sure wasn't that way when I was growing up in the 60s. Yes, well I can't to the 60s because unfortunately I wasn't around yet. <laughs> I was born in the 70s. But I, <laughs> and I will also preface that with I, I was kind of oblivious in, about influenza until 2009 when my son passed away. So, you know, I will tell you what I do know. Um, in 2004, the CDC started tracking pediatric flu deaths, and obviously, as of late, um, you know, there is a lot of emphasis on influenza and people being hospitalized and people dying and the importance of annual flu vaccination. And I think, you know, maybe especially recently because we are seeing these tragic stories that more and more we're seeing increased level of communication around it. So 
flu vaccination has been around for decades. Why it wasn't as popular, you know, decades ago than it is now, um, I think it's just the level of awareness. And with that, it's probably, you know, te- technology. We're so much more connected now, be it social media, digital media. Um, and, and I think maybe that's just a simple explanation for, for why there's more conversation around this, this topic compared to decades ago. Right. And I would only add that I just that I think that it's also the technology that we have now to assess the number of deaths that are associated with the flu um, annually as well. It really adds some context as far as being a public health priority um, when we have the ability to um, to assess the impact of, of not vaccinating and, and the flu um, virus in general. So absolutely. Um, the yeah, next question point. that we had had come in was from Sarah. She says, "How do you convince someone who says he never gets sick and doesn't believe he can get someone else conta- or he can, that he's contagious? This person is very healthy and never gets the flu or a cold. I tried the herd immunity idea, but it didn't work. Thank you." Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, I think there's going to be some people that that whole concept of community immunity is going to resonate with and other people who it will not. So I don't think across the board that whole concept is going to necessarily be a motivator, but I have had evidence that in some instances it will be. I will give you a personal example. I'm going to use my neighbor. I use him frequently in the story. So he's, <laughs> he's six years old. Never been vaccinated. Um, I've lived here for five years. He's been my neighbor for five years. And every year I had the same conversation with him. He has a 20-year-old diabetic son. And it wasn't until I explained to him that it wasn't enough for just his son to be vaccinated against the flu that the dad, he, my neighbor, needed to be vaccinated as well to provide that extra layer of protection for his son. That is what flipped the switch for him. He went out last year and got a flu shot for the first time in his life at 60 years old. So I don't know this particular person, obviously, that you're talking about, but I'm assuming they have a family. So, you know, maybe if you, if you can, if you're close enough to that individual where you can bring up the fact like, hey, you're your significant other, your son, your daughter, your parents, whomever it is that is a loved one to that person, you know, and coming at it from that angle. Because I think the community at large is an ambiguous concept, right? Like, I understand it. I'm sure you guys understand it. But you're right that explaining that societal obligation, if you will, if we want to call it that, to somebody may be a little bit too fuzzy for them. So talk about their loved ones. You know, and say, hey, it's, it's not enough for, for them to be vaccinated. Um, obviously, you know what to say with the individual that even if you are healthy, you could still be hospitalized and die. But maybe coming at it from just a perspective of how that would help protect their loved ones, maybe would give you a little bit more traction. Maybe you've already had that conversation with them, though. I, I completely agree. I think even maybe to, to turn it on another angle as well, if, if, you know, that altruistic perspective doesn't work for him, right. you know, either way, then maybe just to say that, um, well, sure, you've never gotten the flu um, up until this point, but by getting the flu vaccine in the event that you do, it's going to be a lot less severe than had you not been vaccinated. Um, so there's That's all kinds of research to back that up as well. So, I mean, even in the spirit of self-preservation to think, um, you know, especially if he's older, um, the older you get, um, the more the likelihood increases that you will be severely impacted by the flu virus. So maybe, you know, that, that perspective, too, if he's not too worried about those around him. Um, and then the, you just never know. You have to use all, all your tools. Um, exactly. And then the, exactly. So um, another question came in um, from Alethea. She asks, um, but do you think the flu virus has gotten more potent over the years. Um, I will only say personally that with, as with all viruses, they mutate and change. Um, I can't, that's not my area of expertise, so I can't really speak to whether or not that's, that's true. Yeah, I would agree, Brianne. I am not a medical professional either. I think, as Brianne said, the flu virus 
boy, it's a it's a complex virus, and you know, they, there's drift, there's shift. The fact is that this virus is a chameleon. It can change quickly. It can change slowly. It's, you know, it's elusive sometimes. So I'm not so sure from my layperson's perspective that it's gotten more potent. We know, you know, this year is a 100-year anniversary of the 1918 pandemic. So, you know, which killed 50 million people worldwide. I think the flu virus, regardless of which strain we're talking about, has the potential to be serious and even lethal. So um, it's just a complex virus. And that's why I think, you know, when we talk about flu vaccine and people get down on the whole effectiveness end of it, um, I think the, the general public doesn't understand how hard it is. You know, there's worldwide surveillance going on. Um, on the circulating flu strains. It's just that this is such a dynamic virus, it's hard to keep up with. We, you know, we have certainly tools right now that we're using, but it's a tricky virus. So it, I think it's, it's definitely dangerous now, but I think it's, it was dangerous decades ago as well. Absolutely. Um, the, the last thing I want to wrap up with, um, just because we are out of time, is one, if you do happen to have any more questions that pop up after the webinar that you don't feel um, comfortable broadcasting to the group, um, please send that to info at immunizednevada.org, and uh, Cerise and uh, the staff at Immunize Nevada will do our best to answer those questions. Um, and then also, I just wanted to point that in the chat box, I linked to both Families Fighting Flu's Healthcare Professional Toolkit and the toolkit that we have available on immunizednevada.org. Um, they're both um, excellent resources, and I think it was a great point that Cerise made that you don't have to come up with this content on your own. There are pre-made things that you can share if you follow um, either of our organizations um, that are impactful and meaningful that you don't even have to think up. So um, please check out those two toolkits, and I'll send the, that information out post-webinar as well. And um, with that, I would just like to thank Cerise and Maroda for joining us today, especially today um, of all days, to share this really important information um, for Nevadans. And let's hope that this flu season bears a little bit better of a flu vaccination coverage rate. So thank you, Cerise. Yes, thank you. Okay, have a great day guys. And also just a reminder, please complete that uh, survey after the webinar if you would like to earn that CEU credit. Thank you.